Welcome everybody to this latest episode of Star Cells and God. This is the podcast where we explore how the latest discoveries at the frontiers of science provide evidence for God's existence, the reliability of scripture, and the credibility of the Christian worldview. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. This is uh, an organization that demonstrates the harmony between science and the Christian faith, opening people to the gospel by revealing God in science. Uh, Reasons to Believe is the organization that sponsors this podcast thanks to the generous donations of viewers and listeners like you. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe or if you want to support this podcast, please go to our website, reasons.org. You can also follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And of course, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, and subscribe. There you can gain access to all kinds of great science faith content and use the notification button so that you can be alerted the next time a new episode of Star Cells and God drops. I have the distinct pleasure today of being joined by Dr. Uditha Jayatunga, who is from the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Jayatunga is a member of the Reasons to Believe Scholar community and is going to be our guest on today's program as we explore the astounding complexity of the human brain. Uh, Dr. Jayatunga, uh, Uditha, thank you so much for being here with us today. Since this is your first time on Star Cells and God, and I hope not your last time, uh, uh, please tell our, our viewers just a little bit about yourself so they get a chance to know you uh, before we start getting into this really interesting topic about the brain's complexity. Right. Thank you, Faz. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, do this presentation. Uh, as you said, I am part of the scholar community, and this is my first direct uh, contribution. So I am looking forward to for it, as, as well as uh, any future um, future programs I could contribute to. So uh, I became a, a member of uh, Reason to Believe following uh, the publication of my book, yeah. which is uh, Intelligent Design as Proof of Creation and Scientific Analysis. I'm originally from uh, Sri Lanka, but I've been working in UK for the last 35 years. I'm uh, still working, I'm part retired. Um, I'm a, a consultant in rehabilitation medicine. Most of my work is uh, neuro rehabilitation, so related to brain injury. In fact, I do, um, uh, most of my patients are brain injury patients and I do specialist brain injury clinics. So therefore I have got a particular interest in uh, brain related matters yes and and uh, in my book also i have uh, dedicated one chapter to complexity of the brain um so um so thank you very much for give, giving me this opportunity yeah yeah okay well we're so glad to have you and i think because of your work you know, with uh, patients who've suffered from brain injuries, you have a, a really interesting perspective on the brain because it's you're not looking at the brain as it normally functions, but really you're looking at what happens when there is an injury or an abnormality in the brain. And as life scientists, that's oftentimes the best way to truly understand not only how a biological system works, but it really gives us insight into the the complexity and the fine tuning, uh, you know, of those biological systems, and that's very much the case for the brain. Um, so we're going to be focusing on the brain's complexity today, and you know, in you make the point that the brain is the most complex structure in the universe. So why don't you elaborate on that point a, a little bit? That's right. So. Um... In many uh, evolution uh, uh, discussions, I have seen the complexity of the eye being discussed, but not much concentration on 
the complexity of the brain. Of course, the eye is complex, but brain is the most complex uh, structure, uh, as we know. And um, it is said that it is the most complex structure in the universe. And also, we, uh, we know about uh, distal galaxies more than our brain. It, that's actually a pretty astounding point that we actually have a better understanding of objects right. at great distances in the universe than we do about the human brain. That's right. I want to elaborate a bit more on the most complex structure in the universe. I mean, I, what I mean by that, if you look at look around, uh, some of the most complex structures are uh, man-made structures are. International Space Station, Apollo mission uh, to the moon, mission to the Mars, and Hadron Collider. And uh, so what I'm saying is, or what is well recognized is, our brain is more complex than all complex man-made things. So that that shows how, how complex the brain is. So if I... Uh, as we know, everything we know or think comes from our brain. Our, brain e our brains are the window to reality. Our human superiority is due to our brain power. Now, the brain is so complex, and it can be described in many, many ways. It can be described as cells, proteins, chemistry, biology, transmission, electrical impulses, circuits, neurophysiology, neuropsychology, genetics, pathways, and brain function. So it, there's quite a lot. I will touch on some of them uh, uh, through, in this, uh, this discussion. So if you look at the brain structure, there are 86 billion cells in our brain, 86 billion, at least 86 billion. And these cells are being communicated by things called neuropeptides. And so far, they have found about 100 neuropeptides. And recently, the European Brain Project had identified 7,000 proteins in the brain itself. Mm. And if you look at the various components in the brain, there are about 500 components and brain the all the uh, stimulus for the brain comes or major uh, some of them come from the peripheral nervous system which itself is thousand kilometers and our brain is relatively larger than most uh, animals of our size so um, in the next slide, I have shown, uh, I have given a description of cellular complexity of the brain. Now, uh, this is from Allen Institute for Brain Studies in USA. And as I said, they have identified at least 3,000 types of brain cells, and this uh, shows the cross-sections at, at what cross-sections do have uh, various types of differences. And you can see the complexity of this cellular distribution map. The, the, it is not only the cellular distribution, but you then need to add all the neuropeptides, the, the neural pathways, so you can realize how much the brain, uh, how, how complex the brain is. So we, ha we have got about over, over 20,000 or 20,500 genes uh, in us. And out of about one, out of that, about one third is for brain function, so around maybe 6,500 genes. But human cognition itself, 
human cognition has taken extra thousand new genes, thousand new genes for human cognition. I will come on to this uh, a bit later again. Now, if you look at the brain connections in the next slide, each cell, each brain cell has got at least 10,000 connections, at least 10,000 connections. Some, some areas like the back of the brain cord, which cerebellum, which coordinates movement has got 40,000 connections. One cell has got 40,000 connections. And the capacity of each neuron connection, no, the capacity of each neuron connection is equivalent to a laptop. That's astounding. <laughs> capacity of each neuron connection is equivalent to a laptop. So the total connections in the brain is uh, one quadrillion, so 10 into the power of 15 connections. And if you take a cubic centimeter of the brain, it has got 400 billion connections, more than the uh, stars you get in the Milky Way galaxy. And none of these connections are random. So here in the next slide, I have shown two areas of the brain. One is the thalamus. Thalamus is a small uh, thumb sized area in the middle of the brain. And the other one is the brain stem. Brain stem is in the back of the brain, which connects the spinal cord to the brain. So brain stem has got 100 nuclei, 100 nuclei. And this thalamus has got 60 nuclei, right? So uh, they, they, these are mostly relay centers. So they get information from one area and they, they, they try and uh, recognize those uh, 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 the um, messages and uh, send it to the other, other parts of the brain. So these are relay centers. And I'm going to show in the next slide, uh, uh, this shows thalamic connections. And uh, so out of those 60, I have shown four connections of four nuclei. You can see how complex the connections are. And that is only for four. So there are 60 uh, altogether, and that is only for four. And we need to recognize that those connections have to be exact. In many evolution um, discussions, I have seen uh, many evolutions uh, saying that when he, uh, throughout the evolution cycle, the brain size increased. Now, it is like saying, if you say a helicopter engine has evolved to a Boeing aircraft engine, it is like saying, oh, Boeing aircraft engine has got more metal or more nuts and bolts, right? But when you, when you want to describe the evolutionary changes in the brain, you need to go to these pathways. You need to go to these cells. You need to go to the neuropeptides. You can't just say, oh, it is it has just increased in size. That is, that is not an explanation, if you really think about it, because it's so complex. And, you, you, and, and if, I think there's a, a the, one of the, the points that I've, I've heard you make is that if even one of these connections <laughs> isn't, is abnormal, right, it, it's catastrophic or can be catastrophic. Right. Just, which so under I have shown the thalamic connections with so many uh, 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 the uh, neuro, neuro connections, and if any of those things are not right, we will have an abnormality or we will have a disability. So it is vital to recognize. It's just like the thousand kilometers of peripheral nervous system. If any of the nerve, uh, any of the nerves are not there out of those. Uh, thousand kilometers, we will have a disability. So similarly, 
brain brain connections are, are similar but much probably much more complex and and that actually speaks to the point that you're making about from an evolutionary perspective, you just simply can't say the brain gets larger, right? With having yes, no without, regard. Without, uh, that, yeah, absolutely. So without going into the details, uh, that's that's why I gave the explanation of uh, uh, sort of helicopter engine to a Boeing. You can't just say, oh, it has increased in size or, or there's more metal or there's no more nuts and bolts. You need to put more meat into the bone and explain how these things have happened. Otherwise, it is not explanation. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the brain chemistry, uh, as I said, there are uh, 100 neurotransmitters, uh, and these neurotransmitters work, uh, 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 are distributed in 500 components of the brain. And it is said that each second, there are 100,000 chemical reactions happen in the brain. Now, I want to ask evolutionists, how can random mutations or natural selections get there? Because these are dynamic. These are, if you take the whole day, there will be tens of thousands of diff different combinations. So how can random mutations or natural selection select any of them? And I have given the common types of uh, neurotransmitters, serotonin, gabapentin, dopamine, adrenaline, oxytocin, uh, opioids, cortisol, acetylcholine. So these are some of, uh, some of the neurotransmitters, but as I said, there are hundreds. At least 100 uh, they have identified. So I want to go to about the functions of the brain in life. So if I describe them, uh, thoughts, decisions, memories, emotions, movements, balance, coordination, variety of sensations and responses, physiological processes, breathing, heart function, sleep, temperature control, speech, language, cognition, regulation of organ functions. So it could be the gut, kidneys, lungs, uh, skin, sexual functions, and stress responses. So these are some of the brain, func brain functions. And they are, brain is active all the time. We don't recognize any of those. They are in the background. They are, it's running all the time. And they, these functions are there from the time of the birth, from time of your birth till you die. And the important thing is that if you say that, in any part of your body, you get a new development, right? We'll say a new chamber in the gut. That, ha that change has to be represented in the brain. Mm. Otherwise, it will not work. So even if you say, oh, random mutation gave this change, but it has to follow with series of mutations giving rise to brain changes, otherwise, it will not work. So I'm going to go on to it a bit later again. Yeah. Now, now uh, tell us a, a bit about the, the brain's capacity because you're, you're wowing us with all of these, these great facts about the brain, which, you know, it, even to me as a life scientist, you know, this is, it's pretty mind boggling. So w tell us a little bit about the, the brain's uh, capacity for computation, right? Yes, I think brain capacity is actually mind-boggling. It said, it said that it generates more electrical impulses than whole of the telephone network on Earth. Mm. Our brain generates more electrical impulses than whole of telephone network on Earth. 
Our brain is 30 times more powerful than the most powerful computers in the world. I have given uh, names of some, uh, two of them, IBM Sequoia and Japan's K Computer. Now, IBM Sequoia is in a huge building, huge building, 318 square meters. And it has got 96 racks. <laughs> And it is consuming seven megawatts, but our brain uses only 20 watts, which means that even if you directly uh, compare, our brain is 350,000 times more efficient than the most uh, powerful com man-made computer. So, the combined technology we as humans can produce as at present is no match for the brain power. And also our brain is operating at the level of 1 billion billion calculations per second, which is one exa flop. The fastest computer is one fifth of brain speed. The fastest computer is one fifth of brain speed. And the memory capacity of our brain is 2.5 petabytes, which is same as the internet. <laughs> so if the, obviously we all know internet cannot be a random product and if the internet cannot be a random product. How can the power of brain capacity be a random product? Uh, internet is used by two thirds of world population, 5.3 billion users. And we send 280 million emails or WhatsApp messages every minute. And our brain capacity is same as the internet. And uh, information travels uh, more than a racing uh, speed of the racing car. We produce 70,000 thoughts a day, 150 trillion pieces of information during our whole life, which is more than five times the Encyclopedia Britannica. It is said that if you consider brain as a battery to drain the power of the brain is like keeping a TV on for over 300 years. <laughs> so keeping a TV on for over 300 years, that is if you want to drain the power of our uh, battery power of the brain. So it is actually mind boggling. Now, you know, one of the, the functions of the brain is to essentially receive information from the, the environment right? And then to, to process that information. So you, you point out that the, our senses are actually just as, in many respects, remarkable in terms of the capacity and the complexity as the brain itself. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the brain is connected to some more computers, or I still call them supercomputers. So uh, if, if you take the eye, we can identify 2.3 million shades of color. And it is said that our eyes send 2.3 gigabytes of information every second to the brain. Every second to the brain. This is equivalent to 18,000 songs on, on an uh, uh, iPod. It takes about 13 milliseconds for the brain to interpret an image from the eye. And our eyes are not, uh, as many times um, uh, evolution has described, it is not only the eye, it is the connection to the brain. Mm. And our visual memory means that our World War veterans can uh, uh, give uh, graphic memories which ha could have happened 100 years ago. So our visual memory is part of the, the complexity of the eye. So mm. that, is, that, that those have to be 
discussed when you want to come uh, discuss the complexity of the eye. Similarly, if you look at the taste, uh, we have got 2,000 taste buds, and we can um, recognize 100,000 tastes. If you take smell, uh, smells, 100 trillion odors. But when it comes to some of these features, though we are at the top of the uh, tree, evolution tree, as they say, some of the animals have better ranges, particularly when it comes to hearing. We have got a range of 20 to 20,000 hertz, but some animals have got either lower, uh, they can recognize a lower range or higher range, like elephants. That's why elephants escape the tsunami because they, they manage to run, uh, run inwards. Uh, whereas bats and whales and dolphins, they have got higher frequencies. So though we are the superior species in some aspects, some animals have got better ranges. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that we uh, take for granted as human beings is, is our ability to commu communicate. And we communicate almost effortlessly with language. We really, when you think about it, learn language almost effortlessly as well. Uh, but yet that maybe help, maybe is to our disadvantage because I don't think we fully appreciate just how remarkable our capacity to communicate is as human beings with language. So that's elaborate right. on that a little bit, please. Yeah, that's right. So um, we are a superior uh, species for three main reasons. Our cognition our uh, speech and language and our hand function. And all these uh, uh, aspects are very, very complex. Uh, when, when you talk about speech, uh, we, could be, we, we could whisper or we could orate, we can shout. And if you're singing, we, we could be uh, doing rock singing, gospel singing or opera singing. And our, our, our thoughts are translated to speech and our voice comes from vibration of the vocal cords. So the, our vocal cords oscillate when we speak 100 times a second. Vocal cords oscillate 100 times a second when we speak. And they are not just oscillations. They are remarkably controlled by the brain. And when we sing 400 times a second, so this is the complexity of the brain. You know, we don't recognize those. We, we take things for granted. And um, so, uh, you, you know, these are some superior aspects of our speech and voice. Uh, going on to language and, and, and communication, we as a species, we share our thoughts, ideas, and feelings through language. It is the cornerstone of our civilization. There are two main areas in the brain called Broca's and Wernicke's area in the brain, uh, which is linked to uh, our, our language. But uh, there are connections with all parts of the brain. Uh, so uh, other communication could be in addition to speech, the comprehensions, reading, writing, and through uh, language, we do, we have social interactions, education, literature, art, music, science, and our gestures. Uh, we have lots of gestures. It says that we have got uh, Hundred thousand, uh, sorry, ten thousand facial ex expressions. Out of that, three thousand are related to emotions. So we have got lots of ways of of uh, communicating. Now you know something that I think is really interesting is this whole idea of the hand brain link, right? Because something that also makes us remarkable as human beings is the the manual dexterity that we display. You know, and yeah. and I think, again, because we do certain things with our hands so effortlessly, we really 
fail to realize how remarkable that capacity actually is from a biological perspective. Uh, absolutely. I'm going to uh, discuss uh, uh, the hand in detail, and I'm going to uh, make a significant challenge to all evolutionists uh, based on our hand function. So evolutionists say that we have evolved from ape or probably common ancestor. They are looking at the similarity of the structure. So bone structure of the hands are similar to apes. And therefore, they commonly say, oh, we have evolved from the ape or the common ancestor. The thing is, if we don't look at the totality of the function, I think we, lo we lose the plot. In mm. everything, we need to be looking at the totality of the fun uh, function, not only the anatomical uh, and uh, not only anatomy. So apes are knuckle walkers and we have got opposed uh, uh, thumb opposition, which is a remarkable development. And through that, we have got dexterity. And if you, if you look at the hand function, now we'll look at the functional aspect of our hand compared to the ape, apes. So we can express joy, despair, surprise, hope, or disappointment with our hands. Mm. Our hands can support appeal, help, welcome, applaud, and or express approval. Uh, because of this, sometimes it is described as outer brain because of our hand function. Mm. We can threaten or express sympathy or empathy with our, with our hands. With, uh, due to the dexterity, we, we uh, we can uh, do handwriting, we can do finer movements, we can use, his, you, use hand power for sports, gripping, and we are the only, only species on earth who can throw things accurately. We are the only species on earth who can throw things accurately. So even if you suddenly become blind for whatever the reason, with our hands, we can identify things by touching, whether it's soft, softness or hardness, stickiness, slipperiness, mm. texture, and temperature of the surface. So this is why sometimes they, they describe the hand as the outer brain. It is not a commonly used term, but it is mm. uh, sometimes described uh, uh, as the outer brain. And because of that, the hand has got a bigger representation in the brain, as you see in the next slide. So the hand and the mouth has got much bigger representation in the brain because of this, uh, these uh, functions. So if, and, and those run into billions of, of neurons, and it is only, not only those billions of neurons, but once again, we need to look at the neural connections. Now, the challenge to uh, the evolution, particularly uh, the ape to human um, evolution, is that even if you say that the distal changes, again, the distal changes like the bone structure, the, the muscles, even if we say that those could come via mutations, we need to have simultaneous brain changes mm. to make use of that. If not, our hands will be useless. So, so which means that it is not one mutation. Once again, you need series of mutations or maybe hundreds of genes for it to work. Because without if one have one uh, the peripheral changes happen without the brain changes and if it has to wait for 10000 years it's of no use so those changes have to happen yeah. simultaneously this this is a this is a challenge to evolutionists 
to explain how this could happen. And once again, in my opinion, in any part of the body, if there's a major change, mm -hmm. rest of the body systems have to change. The rest of the body systems have to accommodate. So there has to be, it's not one isolated uh, random mutation, you need series of uh, mutations. Now, you know, we also, our brain also controls our body's musculature, right? And there's a large number of muscles in, in the human body. I don't know off the top of my head what the number is. But that, again, is something that is remarkable when you think about what the brain is doing in terms of, you know, controlling our musculature, which is really critical not only for movement, but for some for vital, vital organ function, right? Absolutely, absolutely. When you look at all these functions, it is actually mind-boggling. So we have got about 650 muscles. And when we take one step, one step, we use about 200 muscles, <laughs> just taking one step. So if you do sports or, or rugby or what, whatever it is, you'll be using three, 400 muscles, right? And our brain automatically coordinates these muscles. When we frown, it coordinates 47 muscles. When we smile, 17 muscles. When we swallow, 22 muscles. And within just a second, within just a second, and if any of those muscles don't work, we will have a swallowing problem. We will have aspiration pneumonias. Our eyes, eye muscles focus 100,000 times a day. And all these muscles have to fire at the exact time. So in the next slide, I have given this directly from my work. It is called uh, functional electrical stimulation. You can see a stroke patient walking with an awkward gait. Now, we stimulate one or two muscles to get that get his gait right and as you could see with the stimulation we can get his gait right our current technology with our current technology we can only uh, stimulate about four or five muscles at any given time at any given time but our brain controls 200 muscles and the the distribution is uh, given there. That has got about 20 muscles and brain controls 200 muscles. And you have to rec recognize that this is just within one second. These, uh, these muscles fire just within one second. They fire and relax and they, it, it needs to happen in that exact order. So that is the power of the brain. Now, again, coming to evolution, how could they describe these dynamic changes? Which combination are they going to say that random mutations have uh, given rise to? Because these are dynamic changes. Throughout the day, those combinations change all the time. So how can evolution um, sort of... Uh, explain these dynamic changes. It is not like a beak where they, 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 they uh, sort of, uh, uh, they mention the dynamic changes are extremely difficult to be explained through evolution, just like the uh, chemical reactions I mentioned before. Now, so, yeah. sorry, what, what are some other critical brain functions? You know, we've... So, so we, we don't think about, our, uh, uh, um, for example, movement or muscle function. Brain automatically does it. So we don't have to worry about it. But we see it when there's damage to the brain. Mm. Right? So in the next slide, you can see a, a child has developed scoliosis. So throughout our life, brain controls the muscles symmetrically in our spine to keep us uh, straight. But if there's a brain damage, then you recognize the function of the brain. So you can see the awkward mm. shape of the spine. So this is one example of 
of uh, the brain function which we normally don't recognize or uh, in our day-to-day -day life. We also have got lots of different sensations. I mean, a lot of people say we have got five senses, but actually it's much more than that. Uh, hunger, thirst, muscle tension, balance, movement, gravity, itchiness, fullness of the bladder or bowel, uh, chemical signals like when the blood sugar is low, uh, sexual sensations and magnetoreception. So we need all this. And once again, in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't recognize because these things happen automatically. But if we lose one of them, then we see the effects. So that uh, photograph of a uh, child has lost the peripheral sensations and developing ulcers and all the bones are deformed. So we don't, we don't uh, realize in our day-to-day -day life, but if we lose a function, only re we realize the importance of, uh, in this case, sensations or all the other functions. You know, I mean, one of the things that makes us remarkable as human beings is our capacity for cognition, right? And, you know, and so when we think about <laughs> how remarkable, you know, the capacity of the brain to control, you know, all the different aspects of our, our, of, of our physical body, that probably pales in comparison to what we're capable of doing through through cognition. So specifically, what is cognition? And, and is this something that evolutionary biologists can readily explain? I, 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 I doubt it very, very much. Uh, you were uh, mentioning about uh, other brain functions. So uh, brain uh, just uh, control our blood pressure, digestion, continence, sleep, sexual function, and it is controlled through uh, the glands in the underside of the brain called pituitary and hypothalamus. So these, some of the other ways, through hormones, brain, con brain is controlling various fu functions. And um, I, I will just come on to your thing about cognition. But be before that, I just want to mention about perfect systems. We are physiologists have got perfect systems. We do gait analysis on our, on, on our patients, right? When we get them to walk in a gait lab, you can see the gait parameters are 100% eff efficient, effective, and uh, uh, with, with uh, max maximal energy efficiency. And that is a sign of design. Mm. But on the other uh, picture it shows a child who, who has got cerebral palsy. Now you can see how abnormal his gait is. If we say that evolution has given rise to everything, we should be seeing the gait like the cerebral palsy patient, not perfectness, uh, not perfect. Uh, mm. uh, 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 get get dynamics. So, you are asking me about cognition. So it has been recognized that uh, human cognition has had for human cog cognition they have identified thousand new genes, thousand new genes, and the cognition is supplemented by all other sensory input. So we have the ability to uh, respond to goal-oriented behavior as opposed to momentary sit uh, situation responses, which we see in animals. So that's one of the uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, superiorities we have. We understand what is right 
and wrong moral values, whereas animals have instinctive responses. We understand the meaning of life. We can work towards building our character. We can wander, we can speculate, we can research, we can learn, think of the future. We can adapt to the surroundings or we can modify the environment to suit our needs. We can understand the beauty in self or others. We can, we can, uh, we can appreciate the works of art and designs. We can experience joy, sadness, anxiety. We can experience love, have goals, dreams, and aspirations. We have, we have got the power of reasoning. We can solve problems. Uh, we, we can judge uh, in certain situations. We have got long-term, short-term memory. We can plan things uh, which are executive functions, and we have got sexual behavior. Now, these are the human cognitive uh, factors which has come through thousand extra genes. Now, if you look at, these are not life-limiting features. Most of the cognitive features I described now are not life-limiting uh, features. So, if it's random, mm -hmm. if it's completely random, why did we did only we have thousand extra genes? Why couldn't it be distributed across all animal world, and for us to have few of them? And if it's if it's random, then you should expect it to be distributed in the animal world. But no, we have been given thousand extra genes for these specific purposes, and that's a design characteristic. Multitasking is another feature that's again a, a cognitive superiority. I had just uh, given the example of driving the car, uh, driving a car, how many, how many uh, multitasking abilities that mm. has got. So we had to be aware of cars in all directions. We had to feel the wheel, feel the pedal, control them. We had to be aware of the temperature, humidity, wind and rain. We, we can appreciate the scenery. Uh, we can uh, talk to someone, uh, express joy or anger while we are uh, uh, driving. Uh, we can uh, smell food. We can be thinking of other matters. And this is a example of multitasking ability of the brain, which is again a superior human mm. uh, co cognitive feature. So it is very important to recognize these specific uh, cognitive features. So the question you asked me, is this evol evol uh, evolutionary pro uh, progression? I don't think so for the uh, specific reasons I, I gave. Uh, on average, we have got about 27,000 nucleotides in a human gene. And when we talk, when we mention about a, a mutation, it is a change usually in, in one nucleotide. So how can you get 1,000 new genes? It is impossible. So mm. it is, I don't consider it as an evolutionary progression. And also, if it was purely due to evolution, as I said, these uh, genes should be distributed among all animals and all species. So then, um, uh, how intelligent are we as human beings? Because we're talking about this remarkable cognition that we have and capacity to multitask. We are, are super intelligent. As uh, I've seen some, some remarkable things we have done, of course, we can mention trillions of things. But strangely, strangely, we don't understand our brain. <laughs> we, our intelligence comes from the brain, but we don't understand the brain. And um, so Allen Institute of Brain Sciences in USA is one of the pioneering uh, brain research in institutes. And uh, 
the chief executive said the current understanding of brain function is at the nervous system of a worm which has got 302 neurons and 7,000 connections. That is the current understanding uh, they have. And I have shown the, 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 the uh, connections of, uh, of this worm. And that's what the chief executive of Allen Institute uh, says. And we have got 86 billion. So we are no way, no way close to understanding the complexity of the brain. And similarly, uh, the European uh, Human Brain Project, uh, I'm sure you, uh, you may have heard about it, 155 institutions, over 500 researchers, 19 countries, 10 year project, 607 million euros. They have produced 200 and over 2,500 publications. But the conclusion is human brain is one of the most complex systems know, uh, known, and we still don't understand many of the basic principles of its function, which includes stunningly complex picture over 7,000 proteins. Yeah. So this is one of the conclusions of human brain project. <laughs> yeah. So we are no way, no way closer to even understanding even the basics of brain, let alone uh, the complexities. Well, you know, and, and it even is more complex because it's quite fashionable these days to talk about our microbiome, right? And we understand the microbiome is critical for gut health and and you know, other, you know, functions, you know, we be, are beginning to think about disease or, or at least infectious diseases as not so much being invaded by a microorganism, but imbalances in our microbiome caused by not, you know, uh, invasive, you know, microbes. There's also a connection between the microbiome and the brain. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, so uh, th this is not a topic I, I haven't come across being discussed anywhere in, in evolutionary dis discussion. Uh, microbiome means in our bodies we have got microorganisms, usually bacteria, sometimes fungi, uh, uh, viruses, and most of them are in the, la in the large and small, uh, small bowel. And they serve a critical function for our immune system, for digestion, prevention of disease, uh, to make vitamins uh, and some amino acid as it, they prevent diseases. And interestingly, they did a study looking to clear the rats of their microbiome. So they, they completely got rid of all the bugs in, in, in uh, rats in an experiment and they died very quickly. So that's to show the impact of microbiome. Again, another challenge to evolution, when we talk about evolution, we talk about changes to a single animal or single person or single uh, being. But how can, um, re how can mutations respond to the other species, th thousands of species, they say at least 4,000 different bugs, types of bugs are there in, in our body. How can a mutation, mutation respond to the physiology, the biochemistry of another, another species? That is Im impossible. And they are, they are not one or two, so many. So brain and gut microbiome are closely linked. Um, through autonomic nervous system, uh, as I mentioned, the pituitary adrenal gland axis, uh, gastrointestinal nerves, and it is linked if the microbiome is defective, then they say you could have cognitive problems, mental health problems, mood disorders, anxiety, depression, and autistic disorders. So the microbiome and the brain is closely linked 
an another challenge to evolution is to say, how can we as a species respond to so many other species based on their physiology? In my opinion, uh, that is impossible. Yeah. Now, now we uh, have been focused primarily on human brains, you know, and as, are you, as you've already alluded, you know, there are some capacities that animals have that exceed human capacities. And, and in, in many respects, animal brains are just as remarkable as human brains, even though we may think of uh, humans as being, you know, quote unquote superior, you know, animal brains are quite remarkable and what animals are doing is, is quite amazing too, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, listening to my talk uh, up to now, anyone could think, oh, our brains are uh, the most powerful in all aspects. Uh, it's not, because some animals do have remarkable um, uh, brain power, which is well beyond uh, human capabilities. For example, uh, uh, so our brains are superior in many parameters, but not all. So if you look at birds, you know, they, their navigation power is, is way above uh, humans. They, they, they fly to thousands and thousands of miles, they go to the same nest. And um, they are, um, then salmon, uh, they uh, swim back to the same stream, sometimes thousands of miles to, uh, to reproduce. Uh, there are butterfly, uh, particularly uh, monarch uh, butterflies, it flies from North America to Mexico, 4,000 kilometers. And they have got specialized nerve cells at the top of the antenna and using that. So when you look at uh, th these, all these are purposeful adaptations. They're never random. They're never random. They are, they, are, they are for a purpose. Grizzly bears can smell from 18 mile distance. Bats and dolphins have echolocations. They are highly sophisticated systems. So, yes, in many respects, animals do have specific purpose, uh, uh, brain power, sometimes much more than hu humans. And also, um, animals are hardwired at birth, where humans are not. So, as you have seen in many uh, discovery programs, uh, uh, giraffe babies or elephant babies, soon after birth, they had to run with the herd. Otherwise, otherwise they can't survive. Just imagine they can, they, all the m muscles are f have to function perfectly within, within an hour or so. They had to un uh, appreciate the scenery. They had to I recognize all the flock or, 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 or all the uh, members of the herd. And uh, particularly, I want to mention about these lizards. So this lizard in the, in the, the next um, uh, uh, picture is that this lizard was in an egg maybe 15 minutes ago, right? Now, after coming out of the egg, it has to run to the beach. Just to identify the terrain, it needs to recognize all the visual, visual signal, and it needs to recognize the enemy. And it runs, it runs within within just few minutes, runs for maybe hundred uh, uh, meters, jumps from uh, uh, rock to rock to escape. So just imagine how advanced they are nervous system at birth is, whereas humans are so weak. Our human babies, you know, they take months to talk or walk, heavily dependent on uh, parents for years and remarkably unwired at birth. And it's said that 2 million new synapses are formed in infant's brain every second. 2 million new synapses. So humans, human brains are, are um, the human brains develop 
through life experiences, life, family, social experiences. That's how humans have, uh, have been able to dominate the environment. So is the human brain a product of evolution or is it designed? Humans are a weaker species. Physically, humans are weaker species because uh, if you look at the animals, they negate the what environment throws at them. We need, they have better immunity. They have they can run faster. They can jump faster. Some of them have better eyesight, hearing, smell. We need hygienic food. We need clothing. We need shelter. So physically, we are a weak species, but we are dominating this world due to our brain power. And uh, that's why uh, human race is uh, superior. We can explore not only our own environment, but we can uh, even understand the universe. And we are the only species who can understand creation. And I feel that uh, the complexity, purpose, effectiveness, all suggest creation. Well, you know, so it, yeah, I was just Sorry. going to say that, you know, to respond to your point, um, I mean, you know, you, you're making just this incredibly compelling argument that, you know, the, not only the human brain, but the brain of animals, you know, must be designed by a, a creator, by a mind, that evolution struggles to explain it. Uh, and and so we, you know, again, not only see evidence for, you know, God's handiwork, but because we are superior in ways that other animals are not in terms of our cognition, in terms of our language ability, that surely seems to me to provide evidence that humans are made in God's image. Certainly, certainly. So finally, um, human, uh, our brain is the most complex in the universe, unparalleled com complexity, controls, many, many bodily functions and human cognition with its language and hand function defines define human capabilities. And it is impossible, impossible in my personal opinion to be a product of random, uh, yeah. randomness. So I feel that it is the pinnacle of creation. Well, thank you, Dr. Jayatanga, for that fascinating, you know, tour through the complexity of the human brain and, and, and for your, your perspective on, again, the, you know, the evolutionary versus uh, creation model origin of the human brain. That has been, again, quite insightful, and uh, I think you are bringing to the table some interesting and, and unique contributions to the creation-evolution uh, conversation. You mentioned earlier that you had just recently published a book on intelligent design. So tell uh, our viewers and our listeners how they can get, an get access to that, um, that book. Uh, I, I saw yeah, a copy so on is, Amazon. It, yeah, it, it is available and, uh, on Amazon, and I believe uh, it could be, it is available across the world according to the publishers. And particularly, as I mentioned, I got a dedicated chapter on brain complexity. And also, just like uh, as I have uh, discussed many new things like microbiome and the simultaneous changes, as well as the brain complexity, there are many new things I have uh, challenged the evolutionists in my book. Mm -hmm. So I hope, and it cuts across all the evidence from the universe down to the cells and protein. So it cuts across all uh, uh, evidence of design mm -hmm. at every level. It's a simple book, and I hope it will be uh, uh, useful uh, to any reader who, uh, who is interested in this topic. Yeah. Well, again, th thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It, it's, it was, uh, again, very insightful. 
it's now time to bring this uh, podcast to the cl uh, close. And so I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers and listeners for watching. Uh, I want to remind you to visit our website, reasons.org, where you can learn about our organization and where you can also support uh, the work at Reasons to Believe, which makes podcasts like this possible. Also, follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. Go to our YouTube channel, uh, Reasons to Believe, and subscribe. Use the notification button and take advantage of the comment section to let us know what you think about this episode. And uh, we are curious about your insights and your thoughts as well. And I'm just going to leave you with this final thought uh, before we bring everything to a close. Remember, the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. God bless you. Until next time.